Alrighty, welcome back to part three of our uh, Bible study for this Wednesday, the 20th of January, 2021. We are looking at Psalm 28. Um, in, uh, and, Ms. Marla David, yes. And, and if, if, I, if I misspeak, no, excuse me, 29, I was just going to say that in the Vulgate and in the Hebrew, the numbering of the Psalms is one Psalm off. So it's really easy to get, for me, to get confused over whether it's 28 or 29. In the Hebrew, it's 29, and in the RSV, it's 29. So if I say 28, it's because I'm coming back from the Vulgate. This is the, uh, a very ancient psalm. As a, uh, a psalm of David, it is uh, likely amongst the oldest texts that we possess. Because the history of the Old Testament as a text, as a, a written text, uh, w w began really as a compendium of, of written Hebrew in the reign of Solomon and then developed in the priesthood in Jerusalem from that time forward. Uh, and so during the reign of David, uh, so much had not been done that if you went back to the time of David and you... Uh, say you worked with king, say you fought in David's army in the various wars that David conducted as king of, of, uh, of, of, of Israel, uh, you, you would find that, that, that the Israel as it existed at that time in history was very different from what you might think it would be. Uh, because uh, going back that far, so much had not been said or done. Now let me just give you some examples of that as we look at this, uh, this translation of this Psalm of David. Um, the RSV translates verse 1 as follows. Ascribe to the Lord, O heavenly beings, ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord the glory of his name, worship the Lord in holy array. Now, the Hebrew actually, um, in its literal translation, says, give to the Lord. And it is very interesting to me why it's translated as a scribe. They, they chose to use a scribe to the Lord to demonstrate that it is the hearer who gives to God this Respect. It, it is an item of the respect of faith in the direction of God. Ascribe. I, I ascribe things mentally. I, I, I assign things, you see. Now, to give the Lord something is to assume that the Lord is without that and needs that. And so... Um, the, 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 the translation was simply changed, and you can see this if you read the, the King James, because the King James, following the Vulgate, the King James Bible is largely a translation of the Vulgate. It's not entirely that, but it depends very heavily upon English translations of the Latin. Uh, you, you, you get give. It just says, give it to God. Give this to God. And then later on, the decision was made to make it say, ascribe. This part, ascribe to the Lord, O heavenly beings. The literal Hebrew says, Son of God. Who is the Son of God in, in this context, you see? That's the Davidic king. That's David. That is David his self-talk because the Lord in the time of David, in the eyes of David, in the heart of David was David's heavenly father. He was David's 
creator. He was one that David had a relationship to. And, and so you, this is where we have the whole idea that the Davidic messianic king is the son of God. Now this is repeated. Let me just take that one single concept, son of God. Um, Psalm number two, uh, verse seven. You can go from Psalm 29 to Psalm two. Psalm number two, not number two, verse seven says, I will tell of the decree of the Lord. He said to me, you are my son. Today I have begotten you. You are my son. Today I have begotten you. Okay. Um, and that is... Uh, um, a very similar uh, language, by the way, to uh, what it says here, give to the Lord, O Son of God, um, in, the, uh, the, in, the, in the Hebrew, um, uh, and, and it give to, the, give to the Lord, O Son of God, that is David's identification of his relationship with God. That relationship with God is operative throughout the New Testament where Jesus is referred to as the son of David. And I would just uh, give you the New Testament text from Hebrews um, where uh, we have Hebrews 1 verse 5. To what angel did God ever say, you are my son, today I have begotten you? A quotation from Psalm number two. The, the, the idea here is uh, an idea of personal relationship with God. And that idea is 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 just instrumental it's it's incredibly powerful throughout the whole new testament and uh it, it it's it's not translated that way and and it's not translated that way because we have various reactions and various uh counter reactions throughout history to various social processes that occur in the church, outside the church, schisms within the church, different denominations, different attitudes, different belief systems, different ways that evolve, all using the same scriptures, that uh, the translators, um, and I know very well the, the mindset of the translators of this RSV, uh, uh, who were very well aware that this text would be used throughout churches, thousands upon thousands upon thousands of churches throughout the world, that this effort they were undertaking in the uh, late 1940s in translating the RSV would, would be uh, uh, giving us a Protestant English translation of the Bible that would be used generically throughout churches. And I think that the desire was uh, that, that, that we didn't want to become too humanistic in our translation, um, emphasizing uh, where it says, if we do it literally, a Psalm of David, uh, uh, give to Yahweh, ye son of God, Give to Yahweh the, 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 the listing of the, the, of the attributes that are given um, in the psalm. Um, give to the Lord, um, read it in English here, um, where it says, uh, um, uh, Give to the Lord glory, strength, the glory of his name, uh, and, and that what it is saying is kind of by the language as it is developed, 
that there is a notion of separation between the hearer of the words and the person of God, a, a, a level of separation. Th this is something that churches have done in a sense of, of underlying, underlining their own necessity. Uh, going back into the Middle Ages, uh, you have to have the priest, you have to have the minister, you have to have the translator, you have to have the interpreter, you have to have the church. And the church is the intermediary between the believer and the Lord. That separation, by the way, in contemporary society in 2021 is fading. It, it's fading rapidly uh, because we, we see the universe, we see the world in a very different way uh, than we saw it even in uh, 1949 when my professors were sitting around a table doing this translation. Um, and, and I knew them in the early 80s, and so when I, I, I speak of their mindset, uh, I think I, I have some qualification uh, to do that. Uh, to, uh, uh, to, I was to, 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 to uh, literally uh, be at that table in the sense of understanding the, the implications of the art of translation. Now, um, I am, uh, am, am going to wrap up this part at this point, and I am going to be picking up with the next part in just a minute.